Mark Johnson and Catherine Harris. Mark is the director of programs, and Catherine Harris is the vice president of business development of Improbable. And they've created a demonstration that can answer some questions. Thank you. Hey, good morning, Catherine. You got that? Good morning. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Take it away. Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to uh, Susan and Adam and uh, the Elliott School for hosting us and uh, Elizabeth for that excellent uh, uh, introduction uh, and framing remarks. Um, as Elizabeth noted, uh, we will provide a, a high level overview of the technology that underpins uh, extended reality in the metaverse and synthetic environments. So go ahead, Mark. So uh, we'll define a few key terms. Uh, we'll walk through the tech stack of the different technologies and components that uh, enable this technology to come to life. Uh, and then uh, we'll give you a demo uh, of a capability that we've developed uh, at Improbable for our national security community to talk about how these technologies can enable uh, international security missions. And then we'll leave time for Q&A at the end. So key terms, um, uh, Elizabeth talked a little bit about this as well. Uh, what is extended reality? How is it different from the metaverse? And how is it different from synthetic environments? Uh, that's the, the world that uh, Improbable lives in. We build synthetic environments for our defense and national security uh, customers and partners. Uh, and we also have a commercial uh, side that works with gaming uh, and live interactive virtual events as well. So as Elizabeth, Elizabeth said, uh, extended reality, really an umbrella a term that really talks about immersive technology that blends the physical and virtual worlds. I think that's a piece of the metaverse. Uh, the, the metaverse is, does not have a, a clear definition, as she said, but there are some attributes and elements that tend to be common to that. Typically, it's real time. It can be 3D or 2D, but mostly 3D. There's a persistence to it. Users or participants in the metaverse uh, experience it um, in a synchronous sort of way. Uh, there can be a high level, large number of, of users and participants in the metaverse. Um, and they can interact with different objects and communicate and there's an economy associated with it. So these are some of the traditional characteristics that are associated with the metaverse. Another term that you might hear are synthetic environments or geospatial environments. Um, and from, from a technology perspective, from our perspective at Improbable, we define a synthetic environment to meet a set of models or entities, including data, that are described in a bounded environment, often a geospatially bounded environment for a certain period of time. It's a very specific sort of engineering definition, um, but you'll notice the attributes um, are not as specific. So for us, a synthetic environment can be 2D or 3D. We're gonna show you a 2D version. It can be real time or you can run things faster than real time. So you might be able in a synthetic environment, for example, be able to do analysis that simulates you know, months or years of a time frame, but to do that in, in minutes or hours to so you can analyze extended periods of time. Um, you can have humans in the loop uh, or real time uh, participants in that environment or not. Um, and the idea here is that synthetic environments are slightly different than the metaverse um, and that they open up a different set of um, analysis options that might be highly relevant to uh, governments and nonprofit organizations they're dealing with really difficult uh, policy options and decisions. Okay, the next slide, Mark, please. So common to all of those, whether you're talking uh, extended reality or the metaverse or synthetic environments is the technology. Um, and, and what is the technology that underpins it and how does all this come together and come to life? <clears throat> Oftentimes in extended reality, people will think about the, uh, the visualization, the headset perhaps that you might be on. It sounds like there are are a couple there in real life that you can experiment with. Um, that's just one piece of the tech stack that's associated uh, with, these, with these solutions and technologies. So here we have six different technology layers that all have to work in concert to bring this to life. Uh, the first one is the interface. So again, that could be the headset, it could be a computer screen. It is a physical device, how a user enters into this simulated world or metaverse or, or virtual reality. The next layer is the visualization layer. These are the actual images that you see on a screen or a device. Often those are rendered through engines. Uh, so in the gaming world, you might think about Unity or Unreal gaming engines, for example, that bring to life and visualize all of the content of the data that is underpinning it. 
The next level is the content ecosystem, as I mentioned, content. So this is data, models, AI algorithms. This is all of the very specific content that comes together. It could be um, terrain, for example. You could look at uh, buildings in an urban environment. It also could be part of the content ecosystem. Weather, uh, patterns of life, um, all of these different uh, uh, elements that comprise the the virtual world are part of the content. Next down below, the next level is the runtime infrastructure. This is really the engine that pulls everything together. I mentioned a term earlier, um, real-time runtime. So that, that means in, everything is happening, you know, five minutes in the simulated environment is five minutes in, in the, in the uh, analysis. Also, you can have faster than real-time. So this is, this is how the analysis actually executes. The next level down is networking. Elizabeth talked earlier about privacy concerns and access. This is where some of these issues arise in networking. So this is how all of the different devices are connected together and what system they operate on. Um, in, a, in a government environment, that might be, you know, which, which um, uh, network, for example, the solutions might be operating and running on, uh, as an example. The networking also helps to make everything connected so that from the user perspective, it feels like you're just in one cohesive integrated world, whereas in reality, that world is probably comprised of different engines, different data sets, different models, different algorithms, but they're all working together. And it's that runtime infrastructure and the networking that brings all of that together into one cohesive world. And then the last element is the hosting environment. So this could be a cloud deploy system, for example, a hybrid or an on-premise or hardware solution, perhaps like on a deployable laptop. And so all of these different technologies come together um, and what you experience as a metaverse is really underpinned by, by all of this. Next, Mark. So over to Mark, we're gonna walk through uh, how we pull all of this together for, uh, for the defense community. All right, thank you, Catherine. Um, all right, so given that understanding of, of all the different parts that make up the virtual world, let's walk through an example of what that would look like. Um, so the clip you're about to see is uh, uh, from a simulation that takes place in a virtual representation um, of a district in uh, Taipei, Taiwan. So uh, as some of you know, every year for the last 45, four years, Taiwan has conducted nationwide uh, air raid drills to simulate an air attack um, from Chinese forces. Uh, or in their words, prepare for danger in times of peace. But the biggest problem with a once a year nationwide air raid drill is that it's simply not enough. So it raises awareness, but it doesn't generate enough data um, about the population or its reservist actions to actually drive policy or, or materially impact the effectiveness um, of its civil defense. And even more specifically, um, these live drills don't adequately uh, measure mobilization times concurrently with other multi-domain effects like uh, disinformation campaigns um, or um, bombing operations. And that's the kind of data that can actually inform and influence decision makers uh, and policy. Um, estimates on how long uh, Taiwan can defend itself against the PLA invasion prior to the arrival of US reinforcements range from anywhere from, from two to four weeks. Um, so any information that we can derive um, about those mobilization times can and should be um, impactful of the US operational planning for invasion scenarios like that. And I think that's really further emphasized as we see the um, effectiveness and the performance of the uh, Ukraine military um, in response to the Russian uh, invasion. Right? So instead of preparing for danger once a year, let's see how we can use the power of simulation um, to prepare whenever and, and however we want. So I'm gonna switch over to the screen here. All right. So as I switch over, this particular demo has the ability to run three different scenarios. So one with an air raid drill only. Um, so basically <coughs> population reacts to drill sirens and notifications and then either musters as a reservist or goes to shelter. Um, the second scenario has a real missile strike and then the third scenario has a real missile strike concurrent with a PLA disinformation campaign. And the goal of that campaign is to confuse the population and ultimately decrease the mobilization rates and effectiveness of the civil defense within um, the district. So we're gonna run the missile strike scenario here. So this is a 3D representation of the Taipei district 
we're simulating around 200,000 humans. So each blue box you see is a human entity. Um, this population was generated using publicly available data. So it's actually demographically representative of the population within this district. So um, we control how many entities you see in a particular view, but on the back end, we're simulating that entire population in real time. And then the bottom box on the screen lets us track the live um, status of all of the entities within that view. So as we zoom in on the population here, we'll notice that all of these civilians are following a pattern of life. So that means that they have schedules and goal-based activity planning. And so we call that, um, that's called agent-based modeling approach to artificial intelligence. So basically that means that we give the population goals and objectives, and then given their individual traits and abilities, they act within the simulation to satisfy those goals. So this entire population is basically going about their day um, and waiting for uh, other inputs into the simulation. So let's keep this civilian tagged and we'll zoom out. The cones you see are actually the mobilization points in the area. So that's where the reservists will head once they're notified to muster. And at this point, we're gonna launch the um, missiles into the district and then monitor the response to the population. So as the missiles fire, you'll see um, there's a little icon that's hidden at the moment, but it indicates that there are um, sirens going off. And then as soon as the sirens go off, you'll see the status of the civilian change to seeking cover. So it's responding to the inputs um, into the scenario. So she's not a reservist. So she's actually going to find the nearest shelter that she can. Those red spheres you see are the incoming missiles. And then as we track those and as they come in, you're going to see that they're going to land and those statuses on the bottom are going to keep changing. We're actually going to get some casualty, casualties around the impact area. But the rest of the population is still going to be reacting to that missile strike. Um, so you see that they land, the population is impacted. Uh, those blue buildings actually represent locations where civilians are uh, sheltered. So as they um, go to shelter, those buildings are going to um, fill up and we'll be able to see exactly where uh, the population is able to um, shelter in, in the area. Um, and at one point in a second here, we're actually going to move over <clears throat> to a mobilization point. So the um, pink boxes represent a status of a mobilizing reservist. So they are on their way to uh, mobilization points. And um, in a second here, we're going to click on one and we're going to verify that as they kind of head to their rally point. So I guess towards the left of the screen, now center, you can see that all those pink boxes are going through that to that cone. Um, those are the reservists actually going to their um, going to their rally point. So they went up from here. Let's see that. All right, so that's a reservist mobilizing go to the go to their rally point. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop this, and then I'm going to return to that tech stack that Catherine had just talked about. And we're going to talk, walk through what we just saw. All right, so the demo you just saw had no AR, no VR. There were no textures in the buildings, and we had people walking the street. So why, why, do, you, why do you care? And what, what, you should, what should you take away from this, right? And the answer to those questions why inside of this tech stack. So the interface, as Catherine mentioned, the how a user interacts with the simulation, and then the visualization, the graphical representation of that virtual world are only pieces of a synthetic environment. Um, the important outputs of the scenarios that I just saw were actually the, the data, the mobilization rates, given the different scenario inputs that you can compare against each other, um, the, um, you know, where the population tended to congregate when seeking shelter, um, and a, a ton of other statistics that you can derive from tracking population um, at individual civilian levels. So you take away both that interface and visualization, and we can run this scenario faster in real time or as fast as possible. You can do 10,000 runs of this scenario, and we can get aggregate data from that. Um, or you can connect a VR headset and you can train through the drills in a, in a first person mode, right? But the simulation itself, the entities and behaviors of those entities are actually the persistent things. How you interact with that is the thing that changes. Um, how you, the interface and the visualizations are simply lenses through which the user can view and interact with that virtual world. So for example, the Army is gonna show, uh, or have a demo um, ready later today where the lens of AR serves a more specific and useful purpose for experiencing their demo. And so when you do that, when you experience that, I encourage you to think back to this tech stack and figure out where that might fall and what are the different parts of that virtual world and how do they build up to 
build and give you the experience that you're having in that demo. So Catherine's going to um, bring us home and, and talk through some of the international implications of this. Um, and we will, all right, back to you, Catherine. Excellent, thank you. So, you know, I think the biggest benefit of this is you can do things in the digital world that you cannot do in the real world. Uh, as Mark said in this very specific example in the real world, uh, they exercise this scenario once a year, uh, which, you know, is great, but, but perhaps there may be interest and desire to do things more frequently. Uh, you're not going to simulate missile attacks in the real world. Uh, and so these types of simula simulations allow governments and agencies and, and organizations to simulate scenarios that are just very, very difficult to replicate in the real world. Um, Additionally, uh, you know, it allows you to simulate um, th things like information operations that are not physical, uh, things that are in the cognitive domain, for example, to model that. Also to model uh, cross-domain, cross multi-domain cascading effects across, for example, you know, cyber attacks against a critical national infrastructure and public sentiment. I mean, those are three very distinct, difficult things, but but they're all connected and, and how can you model that? Um, it allows you to improve data-driven decision-making. As Mark said, you know, in this scenario, in this example, uh, we capture all the data. It's not just visually what you see, but it's all the data that underpins that. And to be able to stop the simulation and say, oh, precisely what point in the simulation did this event happen or why did this outcome uh, come, come to pass and have all of that data to inform uh, decision-making. Uh, it also enables you to train with realistic scenarios. This is often the most common use case that people think of when we think about applying uh, XR to uh, international security is training. Uh, it's a very close cousin to gaming in a lot of ways, which is great. Um, and it just enables you to have very, very realistic scenarios um, at the moment that you need it. Um, and additionally, uh, because it's, it's virtual, it's digital, it's cloud enabled, it is a very uh, easy and, and great tool to think about whole of government or international collaboration. You don't all physically have to be in the same place and that you can log into these worlds and communicate and coordinate uh, across agencies, across uh, governments, uh, across NGOs and, and others. Um, and we have this great little tagline here uh, that we like to think about um, that these, these types of technologies and tools enable you to interrogate the past, to simulate the present and predict the future, uh, which we think is a really, really, really powerful thing uh, and can be used for you know, COVID and humanitarian assistance and, and all kinds of different uh, issues that, that, that we're all facing um, and can be a very valuable and powerful tool. And I think that's it. Oh, yep, just as a wrap up. Um, so, so kind of two key takeaways, if, if I could leave you with. One um, is that synthetic environments, uh, including the metaverse and XR, are, are they're, you know, comprised of a set of technologies um, and it's not just the interface. Yes, the interface and the, the headset um, is a very, very critical component. Um, but hopefully what, what we shared with you today shows that there's, there's a whole layer of technology underpinning that and there's industries associated with all of that. Um, and a lot of the data, I didn't, I didn't mention this earlier, but a lot of the data that can feed into these simulations can be government data. There's a huge emphasis right now, as you might imagine, you know, governments are sitting on troves of data that's going unused right now. And so how could you take that data and pull it into these simulations and put that data into action for analysis and decision-making? Um, so a set of technologies, it's more than just a headset, there's the whole tech stack um, and the applications are extensive. Certainly training, but preparation, planning, resilience, decision-making, many, many different applications and use cases for international security missions. And I think that's, that, that is our last slide. So happy to answer any questions you may have.